Hello, Jeff Zwerink here. Welcome to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas to help you be more convinced of the truth of Christianity. Today, I'm joined by president and founder of Reasons to Believe, Dr. Hugh Ross, and we're going to investigate some design evidence focused around myopia. Hugh, good to have you here today. Well, thank you. Well, it sounds kind of weird to talk about design around a uh, an infirmity, if you will. So before we get into that, why don't you kind of give us a, just what is myopia and why is it something we should be concerned about? Well, it's nearsightedness. Okay. And, uh, and we now know it's a direct result of the eyeball getting a little longer. Therefore, it doesn't focus quite the way it should uh, for uh, distant objects. So... So, uh, I mean, how big of a deal is this? Is this just a few people have it? A lot of people have it? What? It used to be no big deal 100 years ago. It's now a big deal. And it's a big deal because uh, people are inside more. They're not, out, you know, they're not exposed. Uh, so particularly cities where people are basically in vehicles or inside or in their offices, uh, that's where you see a problem. South Korea is probably the most dramatic example of myopia uh, where you got more than 90% of the population uh, suffering from it. 90%? And, well, in some cases, it's way over 90%. That is a lot of, that's, that's a very large percentage of the population that's de dealing with that, so. Well, one reason why it's so high is it's so easy to treat. I mean, all you need to do is get a special pair of glasses and you're fine. Okay, uh, so you can put on a pair of glasses and not have to worry too much about that. So. But I think that explains why the percentage has gone way up because, hey, if you get it, no big deal, just get some glasses. And so uh, basically it's encouraged people, hey, I don't have to get outside, I can just stay inside all the time. And uh, hey, if I get myopia, just buy a pair of glasses. All right, well, so we'll come back to that in a couple of minutes, but kind of give us a little bit of background. What is it that causes myopia? You said it's the, the eyeball gets elongated, but kind of dig into that, give us a little more scientific details what's yeah, going on there. the lack of ultraviolet radiation exposure, and that explains why uh, it's an inside phenomena. I mean, if you're spending all your time in your home or on a train or in the office, you're not getting exposed uh, to ultraviolet radiation. So, so is that something that even, I mean, do you have to be in a dark room or do, do the windows even filter out the ultraviolet? Windows filter out ultraviolet, some uh, more so than others, but every window uh, filters out the ultraviolet that's crucial to prevent this from happening. The other thing that's interesting, it seems to be morning exposure is more important than evening exposure. And so getting up early, getting outside, mm -hmm. getting that early ultraviolet exposure from the sun, that seems to be what makes the difference. So, so what is it about the exposure to the ultraviolet radiation that makes a difference? What's going on in the eye, if you can give us some more details? Well, there. what happens is it causes the eye to sustain its shape. And so the lack of ultraviolet exposure basically encourages the eyeball to slowly elongate. And that's something they've seen with children in, in uh, South Korea. The older the population, the higher the percentage of hmm. people that have myopia. So it basically is saying this is something that takes time to develop. And so the lack of ultraviolet exposure over the course of 20 years drives the percentage up from a few percent up to 90% plus. So this really is saying that being outside is a good thing. Um, well, so I, I guess uh, another question I have in there, it's like I know our atmosphere filters out a lot of ultraviolet light. So uh, how can being outside help? I mean, ultraviolet well, light's kind of damaging to the human body as well. It is, but the wonderful thing about our atmosphere, it blocks out the short wavelength ultraviolet radiation, which is bad for you, mm -hmm. and allows in the long wavelength radiation, which is important for generating vitamin D as the sunlight exposes your skin. So we need to be exposed to the long wavelength, but not the short wavelength. And Earth's atmosphere beautifully does that. So, I, you know, I, I find that fascinating in part because a lot of my research, especially when you're dealing with gamma rays, you're looking for Cherenkov radiation, which tends to be peaked out in the ultraviolet. And that was always a problem is that the atmosphere filtered a lot of that. It does, um, yeah. <laughs> which is a good thing. Like I said, it, it prevents, you know, because the ultraviolet radiation has caused sunburn. You wouldn't sunburn. be able to do your research <laughs> if it didn't filter it out. Yeah, I mean, that's a little bit <laughs> annoying, but, you know, ultraviolet radiation also tends to lead to sunburn and other sorts of things. So, so it's... Uh, how would you, you see design in this? So kind of articulate, why do you see design in this? Well, I see design in this in that having our atmosphere designed in such a way that it lets through just the right amount of long wavelength ultraviolet radiation 
stabilizes the shape of the eye over decades. And you know, God designed us to be able to live 80 or 90 years. So it's important that our eyeballs are not changed too much over that period. If you're talking an insect, no big deal. Uh, or if you're talking an animal that's only a few years, no big deal. But that's what the South Korean data is showing us. Over the course of 20 years, if you're not being exposed to that radiation, uh, then the eyeball goes unstable. So, you know, I mean, we, we've got a lot of uh, planets that we're finding outside of our solar system. How would this sort of uh, affect where it seems like the, the Earth's atmosphere, the production of the sun seem to be set up so that we get the right amount of the good radiation and not the bad? How would that play out on different planets? Well, I mean, uh, we, you see in the astronomical literature a lot of talk about the ultraviolet habitable zone. Mm -hmm. And that's a recognition that your planet needs to be orbiting a star where the planet is just the right atmosphere, where it lets in the ultraviolet radiation that's essential for life. If no ultraviolet radiation makes it to the surface, life is impossible. There's a lot of molecular processes that go on in every life form that critically depend on ultraviolet radiations, particularly the advanced plants. So you need ultraviolet radiation, but too much is a problem, too little is a problem. And if you have the stuff at the wrong wavelength, that's a problem. So you have to fine tune the what comes through. And it turns out the ultraviolet habitable zone is way narrower mm -hmm. than the liquid water habitable zone. And for a planet to be truly habitable, you wanna be in both. And for very few star planet systems, do the two actually overlap? Well, so, so it, I mean, if. If, if you've got to have the right source, that has comp implications for what kind of star you're orbiting. Yeah, you need the right star. And if you're worried about what gets filtered through the atmosphere, that requires the right size planet with the right size atmosphere. Presumably... Correct. And the right distance from yeah, the star. Yeah, presumably Mars would have less ultraviolet because it's further away, but more because it's got such a minimal atmosphere, whereas Venus would have more, but its atmosphere would filter virtually all of it out. So those are the sorts of complications exactly. you're dealing with yeah. there. So, um, so how, how would you use this, uh, you know, if you could here in like 30 seconds, how would you use this topic to bring up a conversation about uh, pointing to the gospel? Well, just making the whole point. I mean, we live on a planet, we're orbiting a star that must be phenomenally fine-tuned uh, to make our existence possible, especially if you're talking human beings. And doesn't that testify of a personal being that personally crafted the solar system, the universe for that matter, for a particular benefit? And if that's the case, if it's a personal being, wouldn't it be a good idea to, Dia, to find out who he is and whether or not he wants a relationship with us? Well, thank you very much, Hugh. I appreciate your comments. You know, when we look at the place where we live and the ability to even look at things with our eyes requires good eyesight. And what we find is that the earth, the sun, and even the human eyes have to be, it's, it's like they're designed to have good eyesight and to prevent myopia. You know, I'd encourage you to go to reasons.org, check out Hugh's latest blog on this. It's Eyes, Sun, and Earth Designed to Prevent Myopia. It gives you a lot of details of what myopia is, how big a problem it is, and also some of the things that we can do to prevent it, as well as how to use this intricate system that allows us to see to point others to the creator of the universe and how they can know him.